Hi, this is Nicole from Adaptation Station, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to create your own datasheet through Google Forms. To use Google Forms, you do need to have a Gmail account, but those are free and easy to set up. So the best way for me to get to my Google Form is just to Google Google Form. I also have it bookmarked, but that's the easiest way for you to get in if you've never accessed it before. So I'm going to walk you through how to set up a sheet. So I'm going to go into my Google Forms. And here you can see all of my forms. And right here is the data that you that I set up for you to practice. But we're going to set up a new data sheet right now. So what we're going to do is we are going to click blank form up here in the corner. This will take you to a new form. You can use Google Forms for a variety of things. This is a great way to collect information from people for work, for leisure, whatever you need. I actually use this to get orders for my treat cart, which is in another blog post. But I'm going to use the same form for data collection. So one of the things I do in my classroom to maintain confidentiality is all of my students have a color code. So this allows me to speak more freely with my staff members about a student without revealing any information, especially via internet access. So every student in my class has a color. So if this was my student who was color coded pink, I would write pink data sheet on here. For the purposes of this, I'm going to write teal data sheet. I do not have any students that have the color code of teal. But this will be just an example. So once I've typed teal data sheet here, I also click up here where it said untitled form. Now it says teal data sheet and that makes it easier. So I use questions as data bullets. So let's say the first one is recognize 10 sight words. So let's say we want to do that. My biggest tip is to do check boxes. So if you do multiple choice, you'll only be able to select one answer. And if you're measuring multiple things within a question, you want check boxes because that will allow people to select multiple answers. So what I do is I take the 10 sight words and I put them right in here. And what I'll do is put a yes and a no. And I'll explain why after I do this, why that's important. I'm just typing random words here to get through this. See, I already made a mistake. <laughs> so I just keep clicking where it says add option. I just click and then type. Why can I not think of sight, sight words right now? I'm sorry, guys. All right, I think I have 10 now. It's important for you to put yeses and nos because this allows you to better track which words you asked. Now, if I just had the sight words on there and my assistants were just me or my assistants were just checking the words that they read, I would have no way to measure how many words they presented. Because sometimes you might have a list of 50 sight words, but you're only testing 10 at a time. So if you have all 50 sight words listed and you only check 10 of them, I, I have no way of knowing how many you presented. So it's important to give yes and no. So whatever sight word the student was presented with, you can check if they read it correctly or they did not read it correctly. So I highly suggest having yes and no. So now that I have the first goal, I can come down here and duplicate it. So if I'm using a similar format, maybe a behavior goal, I can do just duplicate it using those boxes right here. I don't want to duplicate it, so I'm going to delete. Another tip is I never say required. So required would mean that you had to answer this when you took data. But the reality is when you take data, you're not doing data on every goal every time. So don't click require because that will allow you and your aides or anybody else using this data sheet to just take data on one domain without worrying about the others. Now that I want to add another data point, I'm going to press this plus. Add a question. Let's make this on a behavior one. Let's say that we want the student to work for 10 minutes with 
no prompts. I'll just put it in really basic terminology like that. Of course, it's written more eloquently in my IEPs, but this is enough for myself and my assistants to know what we're talking about. So for this one, because I'm seeing working for 10 minutes with no prompt, I'm going to come and I'm going to choose linear scale instead. My first one is going to be zero because he might run for zero minutes with no prompts. And the last one is going to be 10. And that's good. So I want to click add a question so you can see what it looks like. Right here, I have a scale of 10. Now, if I have any goal like addition and subtraction or anything like that, I always use a linear scale and I always give a sample of 10 problems because it makes it so much easier for me when I calculate the data. So here's a good example. Now, it's said with no prompts. So what do I do about that? When my student starts needing a prompt, I don't make them stop working. I want to track that as well. So I'm going to say again, work with work for 10 minutes with a prompt. And this time, I'm going to go back to check boxes and I'll say zero prompts, one prompt, two prompts, or three or more prompts. So what I would do if I was taking data is I would, as soon as I started working with the student, I would start running a timer. As soon as I had to give them a prompt, I would stop the timer and I would say how many minutes they worked without the prompt. I would then start calculating the prompts up until 10 minutes and I would choose. Once I get to needing more than three prompts, I don't need to keep counting at that point. I already know that they need significant prompting to keep working. So that satisfies that. We're going to put one more goal in and then I'll show you what it looks like on the other end. So for this one, we will do a communication goal. So comment with three or more words. This is a common goal or a goal that this variation is a common goal that I see in my classroom. Oh, I want to do check boxes. So first I'm going to say how many words or yes, how many words they use. So zero words. So if they would not comment one word, two words, three words, or four or more words. I will also put if I had to use a verbal prompt or a visual prompt. And the last thing I always put is comment was relevant or comment was not relevant. So if we're reading a book about trick or treating and the student says, I'm gonna be a wizard, that comment is relevant. But if we're reading the same book about trick-or-treating and the student says, I hate broccoli, that's not relevant. So I want to know, even if they're commenting, I want to know how relevant the comment was to what we were doing at the time. So my goals always, or my data sheets always have more than three goals. But for these purposes, we'll just put the three goals in there. So this little eye right here lets you preview. So you'll be able to see what your data sheet looks like. And right here with send, you can send it to email addresses. So that's how I shared it with everybody on my team. Or you can use a link. And another important thing is if you're setting this up through a specialized account, and I don't have a good example here because it's not, but you will need to give permissions. You want to make sure you make the data sheet open to anybody. You can also just add collaborators. So if you're struggling to get people included, you could just add collaborators here. So I'll add my other account as a collaborator. So if you have an aide and she can't access it, just add her as a collaborator and then she'll be able to get into the data sheet. So now that I have the data sheet, I'm gonna take you to this example and I'm gonna submit some data really fast just so you can see what it looks like. This is gonna take me a minute to do and I apologize. So you can see right there, I gave an invitation to edit, so that makes it easier for other people to access it. This is how easy it is to take the data. And then at the end, you hit submit. Submit another response. So this is another question that I get. If you run multiple trials, like let's say you do the sight words three times in a row, you can just submit one 
group of data and then do it again to submit the new data. So I'm going to skip this one so maybe I didn't work on addition or I didn't work on working for 10 minutes. I'm going to take that off. I'm going to skip that. Hit submit. Okay. Well, I actually ran the site words again. So I would just come, mark it again, and then we're good. That's how I get multiple trials in. That's one of the biggest questions I get is when you're running multiple trials, what do you do? That's what I do. I'm going to do this one more time and then I'll show you how you analyze the data, which is probably the most important part of this blog. Okay, so as the owner, when you are in the data sheet, there's this pencil up here. You're going to click that and that's going to take you to your responses. So you can see the questions here and then the responses. This is where it gets really exciting. Click responses. Look at all of that data already graphed for you guys. The Google Drive will do it for you. So you can come here and you can see you've got your percentages right there. So when I go to do my progress notes, I can say, oh, he read and with 75% accuracy. He read the with 100% accuracy. And I can see how many, how long he worked. He needed one prompt to work for 10 minutes and 66% of opportunities. Commenting. He most often used one word. He most often needed a verbal prompt. And most often his comment was relevant. This information is already graphed for me. I can pop my percentages into my progress notes. I can have comments right there. This is why I love, love, love using Google Docs to graph the data. I hope this tutorial was helpful. If you have any questions about how to use Google Forms, you can always reach out to me and refer back to this video and hopefully it'll help you establish this data collection process in your own classroom.